Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Today marks my 30th episode with you guys, which has just been so much fun and such a privilege for me. So this is going to be the end of season two before we open up next time with the beginning of season three. So it's gonna be same schedule, same everything as usual, but brand new season starting for the fall. To wrap up the season, we have a really exciting episode with James Fenelon discussing his recent book, Angels Against the Sun, a World War II saga of grunts, grit, and brotherhood. James Fenelon is a former army paratrooper turned historian. He served in the military for over a decade and is a graduate of the U.S. Army's Airborne Jumpmaster and Pathfinder schools. The book we're here to discuss today chronicles the 11th Airborne Division, nicknamed the Angels, and their role fighting in the Pacific. This was a really fun episode for me, coming from a family of veterans, including veterans of the Pacific in World War II, as we'll discuss a little bit in the episode. And I hope everyone, whether or not you have military connections in your family or just are an admirer of all that our troops do, really enjoys this episode. So with no further ado, let's jump in to the last episode of season two. James, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Annika. I appreciate the invitation. So by way of background, uh, my great-grandfather fought as a Marine at Peleliu. So the upbringing that I had was very much Pacific focused when we talk about World War II, but very much the Marines did all the work. Um, (laughs) So if you'll excuse the sort of very direct question, um, what led you to focus on paratroopers specifically in the Pacific and what kind of role did they play and did, did they add? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think your experience is very similar to, you know, the popular culture very much is aware of the fantastic contribution made by the Marine Corps in the Pacific theater. Uh, I myself have an army background. And so I served for a period of time as an army paratrooper, which is kind of where I became steeped in the history of, of that organization, which led me kind of to look, you know, backwards into World War II, where the history of that organization uh, began, right? The, uh, the United States Army started experimenting with dropping troops and equipment from aircraft in the, in the 1940s, early 1940, started getting more serious about it um, as war was kind of on the horizon in 1941. And so, you know, a lot of that history though has been, you know, as, as we know, the Marine Corps for the Pacific theater, um, you know, a lot of folks kind of got their interest in airborne operations in World War II from things like Saving Private Ryan and the Band of Brothers miniseries. And I think one of the goals that I have as a writer is to shed a light on some of these lesser known stories. And the 11th Airborne Division in the Pacific is certainly one of those. Um, if I got my numbers right, the, the U.S. fielded 26 divisions in the Pacific theater I think five of those were Marine Corps divisions and the, the other 21 were Army divisions. And so I think that, you know, those those units in the 11th Airborne in particular has kind of been overshadowed by some of the extremely, you know, dangerous and, and aggressive fighting that the Marines did. But this was an opportunity for me to share, share a story of an Army unit. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that there's sort of a modern connection for a lot of people that begins in the Pacific when we're talking about the Army and the Airborne kind of paratroopers Mm -hmm. specifically. Um, So talk to me about that. And I'm particularly interested um, in the link between tactics that might have started in the in the Pacific during World War Two and things that we used later on. Yeah, it's an interesting, it gives us a kind of a wide, wide brush to paint with there. I think, you know, when we when we start talking about the 11th Airborne in particular in the Pacific, you know, it's important to remember they they came into the theater relatively late, I guess you could say. They arrived, their first combat was in November of 1944. That, of course, meant that the Allied campaign, which was at that point, um, you know, what we call island hopping, meaning that you know, the MacArthur and Nimitz had roughly started out, if you will, from Australia, kind of pushing their way up towards Japan, um, seizing a series of islands along the way with the idea that they're going to then turn those islands into logistical bases to then build airfields and supplies so they could keep moving, moving their way forward um, closer to Japan. Mm. 
is kind of how that that got started. And the 11th kind of landed right in the middle of that. And they were their first campaign was um, on Leyte Island, which was the, the first campaign to retake the uh, Philippines. Right. So zooming out a little bit, just kind of for context of this whole thing, um, when I was reading your book, I mean, it struck me, everyone, you know, everyone knows the ending that America does eventually defeat Japan. I mean, how significant were each of these individual battles in terms of the broader strategy? Was it sort of we knew Japan was probably going to lose from the outset. And so all the work that the Airborne did was fighting it out at the end. Or were there really key moments over the course of the story that you tell where the tide really changed? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. I think I think part of that answer depends on what perspective you want to look at it from. And so I think that gives us a good opportunity to understand that wider context. I think, you know, if you look, if you start, if we start with the Japanese perspective of the Philippines campaign, part of that depends on again, who, who, we're, who we're looking at the battlefield through the lens of, right? If you're looking at your average um, on the ground Imperial Japanese infantrymen, you know, they were pretty much, once they were on the island of the Philippines or on the, in the Philippine islands, I should say, um, you know, they were pretty much starved of information. So they were only understanding what they were being told by their superiors, which very rarely had anything to do with the truth. You know, I think I mentioned that incident in the book where they had actually a number of Japanese soldiers have been told that the Americans had been defeated in Europe and Germany had won the war. And these guys really had no way of, of validating or disproving that information. So they kind of had to take it as they were given it. And then you had juxtapositioning that, of course, you had the higher echelons of the Japanese, you know, the emperor and all of the military leaders that were were in control at that time. And I think it's fair to say that they had a pretty good idea that they weren't going to win the war. Mm. And so their strategy at that point became one less of winning the war than it was of not losing the war. Right. And what I mean by that is they, they kind of came up with this strategy of um, all we really need is one decisive victory to really give the Americans uh, a bloody nose so that they'll rethink this island hopping campaign. And, and then we can go to the negotiating table on equal terms. And maybe, yes, we'll end the war earlier than we wanted to, or maybe, you know, without all of the things that we wanted to obtain, but we won't have to, we won't lose anything either. And so that was kind of the way that they looked at these kinds of battles. And so what you see from that, and certainly like your grandfather's experience at Peleliu, you know, you get into these island campaigns where they really become these horrific battles of attrition because the idea was that the Japanese were not going to surrender. They kept telling all their men on the ground that you have to win this this battle because this is what's going to stop the Americans from advancing to the home islands, prevent them from getting closer. And so the Japanese kind of just were throwing everything in, so to speak, with this intention of trying to win this decisive victory and and bring Americans to their knees from this overwhelming casualties was kind of what they were trying to, um, to you know, to sustain upon the Americans. And then, and then on the flip side of that, if you look at it from the Allied perspective, you know, the invasion of the Philippines was was extremely strategic. Not only from MacArthur's personal agenda of wanting to liberate the Philippines, he had lived there before the war. He had made that famous "I shall return" declaration when he was forced to evacuate from the Philippines in 1942. But occupying the Philippines also put the Allies in a very strategic position to cut off Japan's sea lanes, um, which Japan was relying on at the time to bring back natural resources from the areas that it occupied, such as you know oil, tin, rubber, food, things of this nature that they needed to still sustain their campaign. So the Japanese were also very much aware that you know losing the Philippines would put those supply lines in jeopardy. Interesting. And I, I want to put a pin in MacArthur, but I kind of wonder as well, again, from the Japanese perspective, it's well known that the Japanese were loath to surrender and it took two, two, not just one, but two nuclear bombs to make them do it. And when you're talking about that, there's this big difference between what the troops on the ground knew and what the higher ups knew about uh, the futility or lack thereof of the situation. Um, I kind of wonder if that was a factor that played into that, or if you would say kind of religious or other cultural factors were a bigger element of that. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, if we look at if we if we go down a level a little bit and then yeah. maybe use that to bounce back up, if we talk about maybe the, the bonsai charges, right, that were very uh, standard tactics for the Japanese, I think that kind of starts to is an example of kind of bridging the gap there that you were talking about, right? So on the one hand, you have these very archaic tactics um, on the ground, right? And for those of you listening, this is a bonsai attack is basically, you know, a wall of, of Japanese Imperial soldiers online, shoulder to shoulder, um, streaming, running into the enemy positions um, with swords and bayonets fixed on the end of their rifles. Um, this was a tactic that they used over and over and over again that had initially been very successful for them um, in their initial phases of the war on mainland China against, um, you know, not as well trained, not as well armed troops as they would experience later in uh, when they started fighting the allies. But this idea and the way they, they got these guys and encouraged these soldiers to do that was through this, this complicated kind of amalgamation of ancient, you know, tradition, the Japanese warrior ethic they called it uh, Yamato Damashi. I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly. But it was this, you know, kind of um, steeping the Japanese soldier in this righteous cause, this idea that um, if you want it bad enough and you're brave enough, your bravery and your attacking into these situations is enough to overcome allied technology because God and right are on your side. And so I think... You know, that that was something that was believed up into the highest echelons of the, of the Japanese military. Right. And a little bit outside of my area of expertise. But if you look at the battle for Leyte Gulf, which was a naval battle, mm. you know, the Jap Japanese admirals either wanted to destroy the, the American fleet or go down fighting in a way that was honorable. Right. So instead of this idea of like, well, we're going to do what we can. And if we can't do what we want, then maybe we should come back and try again another day. Like, well, at least if we go down fighting, go down with our ship, so to speak, we'll have we'll have projected that that that, you know, that veneer of honor, if you will. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned in the book, I mean, it's shocking how deadly those were at first. I mean, 70 percent, I think, is the number that you give for for casualties. That's like and am I understanding correctly that it was like just with I mean, bayonets, not even really like fully updated at the time modern equipment that's stunning yeah i mean they definitely had their their bayonets on the end of rifles but their rifles were bolt action at you wow. know the japanese the most of the the rifles used by the japanese were bolt action which is not the ideal weapon to be using when you're right. charging forward in the enemy lines you prefer you know at least a semi-automatic rifle which is what of course uh the americans on on leyte in the philippines had and actually just a slight correction there the japanese fatalities were up of 94 95 percent Wow. in some of these battles. And so it really became a, you know, a, a war to the end, a, you know, a, a battle of attrition for sure. That's brutal. Um, you know, it's interesting when you talk about that, my background is more so in ancient history. And it does, I mean, as you kind of alluded to, it does seem like a very ancient battle tactic. It reminds me very much of descriptions of like Caesar going up to Gaul and it's just the Roman army is too disciplined. And so the, you know, the sort of tribal tactics eventually fail. On the other hand, I do think there's sort of a modern comparison where the U.S. actually had quite, you know, has had quite a lot of difficulty dealing with terrorism um, in the relatively recent past, which is maybe not an exact parallel, but does seem at least somewhat similar to the kind of ethos, we'll say, of um, these bonsai attacks. Do you think um, either of those comparisons are fair, or do you have any further thoughts on yeah, the kind of the history, either going forwards or backwards of, of those tactics? Yeah, I think I think there's some great parallels to be drawn there. I mean, I think I'll go backwards and then we'll go we'll go forwards first. But I think, you know, I think that was one of the, you know, one of the limiting factors of the way that the Japanese Imperial Army conducted their their battles during the war. They found a tactic that had some initial success, you know, like I said, on mainland China, this, these bonsai attacks would you know, you can imagine how terrifying it would be to have a wall of people running at you with these swords and these, you know, their bayonets were very long, very intimidating. Um, and so on mainland China, what you'd have in a lot of cases is is the, the, the enemy would just break and run, right? So the Japanese would just keep chasing them forward. And then what they failed to do was, of course, is they came up against a different uh, skilled set of, of, of combatants. They didn't change their tactics. They just kept the tactics the same, which is, 
a mystery to me as to why that would happen. I didn't, you know, I didn't dive deep into why they kept that. But I think part of it is that is that warrior ethos, right? That um, that again, they just needed to keep trying harder and harder. So I, th- I do think there's something to be said about your observation there about you know older tactics in the face of newer tactics. Um, in terms of comparing it to some of the things that we've seen on more recent battlefields, you know, along the lines of suicide bombers, I do think that there's probably something to be said for um, the mindset there, right? To, you know, you're dedicated to a cause that's bigger than you, that um, you're willing to lay down your life for in, in many ways. I think that's kind of where I would draw the line on that is because I think that, that one of the reasons why terrorism is so difficult to fight is in most cases, they're not necessarily trying to uh, gain and hold terrain. Whereas, you know, what we saw, you know, in the Philippines in particular, the Japanese soldiers' objectives were obviously to, you know, kick Americans off the hill, to seize the hill, to seize the airfield, uh, to, you know, whatever objective you may, you know, may use as an example. And so from that perspective, they were using these tactics um, in a very different way or with a different end goal in mind, if you will, than the terrorist maybe who's, who's, who's more inclined to use this as a tactic to, to sow uncertainty, fear and doubt as to, you know, where the, one of these explosions could come from any direction. Right. Right. Interesting. And would you say that there are similarities as well with like guerrilla warfare of the kind that the U S faced when we invaded the middle East in response to terrorism, or is that too strained? (laughs) Um, well, again, I think there's I think there's some similarities there. I mean, I think what's interesting is is that the Japanese could actually probably relate to that more because when they landed in in the Philippines, they experienced uh, an upswell of Filipino guerrillas who were resistant to their occupation, and that's where you start to see things like you know a very active resistance movement in the Philippines of helping the Americans by smuggling out downed pilots conducting reconnaissance efforts for future American campaigns, conducting acts of sabotage. So in that regard, you know, the Filipino guerrilla movement is very much on par with what we think of in terms of the French resistance. Um, And so I think, you know, so the American experience was a little bit less than that, even though you can certainly start to see some of the, you know, the jungle tactics and some of the, um, the things that were going on there may be more similar to, you know, what we what we saw later in Vietnam, just as far as small unit skirmishes and things of that nature. But, you know, the the key difference there in my mind is just that the Japanese Imperial soldier was always in uniform. And so it, and it was always part of a larger battle or campaign strategy that those tactics were being used at, as opposed to, you know, a non-uniformed uh, guerrilla force, which is which is a lot more difficult to pin down. Yeah, talk to me a little bit more about the Vietnam connection, because it does kind of strike me. I mean, there was fighting happening in Europe, which I think my impression, not being an expert on this, my impression is would be a sort of harder comparison to get to how we arrive at, you know, the kind of fighting that occurs in Vietnam. I mean, certainly in the Pacific, the terrain at the very least is quite similar. Um, But I'm wondering if you have any kind of thoughts on if there are any sort of more direct connections between the way that we fought in the Pacific and the way that we fought in Vietnam? Yeah, I think, you know, if we look at the 11th Airborne Division, the guys that I I, I wrote the book about in specific, I think they offer a lot of interesting comparisons there. And so, you know, their first mission, as I mentioned, was to land on the island of Leyte. Um, They were tasked with cutting across the Central Mountain Range on Leyte Island, about 30 miles as, as the crow flies, so to speak. It took them um, over 30 days to, to make that transition because of the steepness and the ruggedness of the jungle terrain. So they were moving at less than a mile a day, basically, during their campaign. And one of the challenges that they experienced as they were moving up into those mountains um, was just the, the setting aside even the, the Japanese you know, soldiers for a minute you know, they're just dealing with, uh, it had been raining for 30 days on the island. So everything is just a quagmire of mud. The trails going up into the mountains um, did not allow for any kind of vehicular support. So Jeeps weren't getting up there. Trucks weren't getting up there. Um, And so once General Swing, the commander of the 11th, had his troopers up in the mountains and up in the jungle, it then became a question of like, well, how are we going to keep these guys supplied with ammunition and food, which are the two prerequisites of keeping your army on the move, right? 
Um, and that's where we start to see some of his imagination, if you will, coming into play, which echoed a lot of the of, of what we start to see later in Vietnam. And, and that namely is he started using his light observation aircraft, these um, single engine Cessna planes, for lack of a better word, that were originally intended to be used as artillery observation planes, meaning that you had a pilot in the front seat, an observer in the back seat who was you know, with a pair of binoculars and a radio, and he would observe and call down artillery fire. Well, Swing started loading these guys up with crates of ammunition, crates of food, and they would fly over into the jungle and then just throw these things out of their laps down to the guys below. They then started kind of expanding some of these clearings in the jungle to where they had small airfields, to where these small observation aircraft could come in and land. They started using those then to evacuate casualties so that they could get them to, um, you know, medical attention, surgical attention faster. And so that's very similar to what we then start to see in Vietnam in terms of using, you know, the ubiquitous, you know, Huey helicopter in Vietnam, where they're using those to bring in supplies, bring out the wounded. And so that's a very apt metaphor, I think, and something that General Swing started uh, adapting from a light infantry perspective almost, if you know, during World War II. Hmm, that's super interesting. What a, yeah, what a interesting, yeah, direct connection. That's phenomenal. Um, I wonder, so I, I had said that we were going to put a pin in General MacArthur. So I want to swing back to that um, because, I mean, again, kind of my family was not so favorable, I think, is the view broadly that, <laughs> that my like veteran family has about Douglas MacArthur. And yet still, I mean, the name has, I think, such a sway, like you know that he's sort of like a a great accomplished man in American history. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit about um, the role that he plays um, for the airborne, like good or bad. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting observation. I think that your family's experiences, you know, I, I've never, I've never run into anybody who, who likes MacArthur. You either love MacArthur or you hate him as far as I can tell. And he's, <laughs> he's definitely a polarizing figure. And I think a lot of that has to do with, um, his ego, right? I think it's very hard for us to understand somebody who who spoke of themselves in the third person, um, who clearly had a very high opinion of himself and his and his strategic and tactical acumen. You know, I, I think you know I've tried to always approach things from a, a balanced perspective, so I always feel like obligated to throw in there when you're talking about MacArthur and you bring up those things. You also have to recognize his his personal bravery. He was not afraid of going out to the front lines, Um, particularly on Leyte. His, his headquarters was, you know, frequently bombed and strafed by Japanese aircraft. And so he definitely, you know, uh, what he lacked in modesty, he certainly made up for in in personal courage. But, you know, one of the challenges that faced the 11th Airborne when they landed on Leyte and dealing with MacArthur specifically was, Um, You know, MacArthur had a very specific need in mind when he was conducting these island hopping campaigns. And it kind of goes back to that that topic we were just talking about, this notion of supply. And, you know, you had to be really buttoned up and on top of your game when you're conducting logistics across vast expanses of ocean. Right. His supply chain, in many cases, started as far back as San Francisco. And so when you're trying to bring all those items across, you want to make sure that when they get there, that they can be gotten to the front line as, as, as soon as possible. And so the challenge for General Swing in the 11th Airborne Division in particular was that they were a smaller size division than the traditional infantry division. So traditional army division was made up of 15,000 guys. The 11th Airborne Division had about 8,500. And so MacArthur was very hesitant to commit them to his, his campaign because he was concerned that, that those reduced numbers would mean they either didn't have enough firepower up front on the front lines because they were sending guys back to get these supplies and bringing them forward, or they just wouldn't be able to sustain their campaign because they were, they wouldn't be able to get these supplies forward if they left everybody up on the front line. And so that was one of his, his big concerns. And that's again, kind of dovetails into that previous question of where general swing really started to get imaginative with how he deployed the unique assets of his division. It even got to the point to where, you know, he was using those small observation aircraft to drop guys into the jungle one at a time. You know, so if we look at, you know, Europe and we think of the large, you know, D-Day invasion where these guys were dropping thousands of guys um, behind enemy lines, General Swing was using these these 
putt-putt aircraft, basically, to drop one guy at a time. And he would just fly them, you know, sortie after sortie after sortie. And, it, you know, at one point, he he dropped 120 guys into the, the jungle using these observation aircraft. It took him like four or five days to make that happen. But again, that was the way that he was getting creative with, you, you know, he had parachutes because they were an airborne division. And he needed to get these guys up into the mountains. And so that's kind of some of the unique ways that he accomplished that. Hmm. And again, with, uh, you know, the Vietnam connection, I mean, you sort of alluded to in your book that MacArthur, um, you know, had kind of a PR spin on this whole thing, which, well, maybe the Vietnam comparison is a little unkind in this instance, but it definitely brought to mind other instances where, you know, the way that the U.S. government has used the way that we talk about war um, Mm -hmm. has had a big impact and like how we fight the battle. That was imprecisely phrased. But in other words, the propaganda needs um, influence, you know, what our strategic objectives are and how and how we fight the battle. Was there an element of that in Leyte? Uh, there was definitely an element of MacArthur using the press to his advantage. Absolutely. I mean, I think I'm not I'm going to get the number wrong here, but it's something like if you go back and look at all of the communiques that came out of MacArthur's headquarters during the war, I think he mentions himself in something like 93 of them, 93 percent of them, and and none of the other units or the commanders that were actually fighting underneath him, you know, are maybe mentioned in the other fraction of those. And so he was very, uh, very much aware of utilizing the press to his advantage to get his name out there. I mean, I think the you know one of the more extreme examples of how that impacted the guys on the ground was in the battle from Manila, which was mm-hmm. the capital city of the Philippines on Luzon Island. And he had, he had, he had already started planning the victory parade Wow! while the fighting was still going on, thinking that, you know, it's going to end here any minute now, and we'll be able to conduct this glorious um, campaign through, or not campaign, uh, glorious parade through the city to kind of, you know, hark the, the return of, the, of, of, of me is kind of what he was looking at it. Right. And he was aware of, you know, the big press attention that had been going on in Europe, certainly with the liberation of Rome and France and things like that. And he felt like Manila was perhaps his opportunity to, to get some of that limelight. Unfortunately, um, the battle for Manila was horrific. It went on for over a month. Um, Virtually impossible to have a parade through Manila because of all the rubble in the streets um, and there was still many weeks of fighting to go when he realized that that plan just wasn't going to be able to happen the way he wanted it to. Wow. Interesting. Um, so I want to zoom out or I guess zoom in technically a little bit and talk a little bit about um, the experience on the ground. And particularly, I mean, one fact from your book that really struck with me is there's a lot of like cultural knowledge about the U.S. internment camps for Japanese citizens. But I had no idea that Japan was doing the exact same thing in the Philippines. So what were they? I mean, were they similar to, you know, what we experienced in America? I mean, I imagine they were not as brutal as what, you know, the Nazis inflicted in Europe. But is there any kind of like parallel, um, you know, motivation driving them or parallel in the experience? Uh, yeah, so you, there, there is definitely some overlap, and it's interesting to kind of examine those those parallels and then and then where they depart from each other. But basically, you know, the what happened in the Philippines and, and several other you know nations during the war is that when the Japanese invaded the Philippines in 1942, there were thousands of um, what they called enemy aliens trapped on the islands. Right. So when we say enemy aliens, we mean um, non-Filipino citizens. So think, uh, you know, American missionaries, uh, American engineers who were there doing contract work, Belgians, French, English. So basically, when we say enemy aliens, you know, using the 1940s term, we mean anybody who is a non-combatant, but a citizen of a nation that we are now at war with, right? And so in the case of the Philippines, um, the Japanese rounded up all of these non-Filipino citizens and put them in internment camps. And so several of them were in Manila. Some of them were, are, you know, outside of the, the city limits there. And they were essentially prison camps. You know, they initially had some some more leeway in that they allowed the prisoners to have limited interaction with the Filipino uh, populace outside of the camp to buy things like provisions and food and and whatnot. That, that access got turned off as the war went went on and it became quite austere conditions. 
Um, certainly nothing like what we see in, you know, the German concentration camps or anything like that. But, you know, there was a big problem with malnutrition. There was a big problem with disease. The Japanese um, army certainly was not, you know, providing medical support or providing any medicine to these camps. And so it became, you know, very dangerous for these uh, internees in terms of just trying to maintain their health. Did, did the existence of those camps play any strategic role in the way that uh, the, the paratroopers took the Philippines? Uh, yeah, so there was a point, um, the, those, those, those two camps that I mentioned that were in Manila were limited, uh, were not, were, excuse me, those two camps that I mentioned in Manila were liberated during the battle for Manila. But there was another camp about 23 miles, 22 miles behind the Japanese lines at that time. And MacArthur and a number of his planners were concerned that as the, you know, American lines continued to push the Japanese army back across the island, that rather than um, letting those prisoners go or evacuating them as they withdrew themselves, they would simply massacre um, the prisoners. And so that ended up being a mission assigned to General Swing in the 11th Airborne Division to go and conduct a raid to rescue these prisoners. And so, again, you kind of see the unique aspects of the 11th Airborne come into play here as they launched a a simultaneous ground attack along with dropping about 120, 130 guys um, via parachute right outside the camp. And together, those two elements um, raided the Japanese prison camp and ended up liberating over 2,000 of the uh, internees. And, you know, quite quite a feat because... In the crossfire, none of the internees were actually uh, killed. So it was pretty, pretty amazing. That's quite impressive. Um, so, I mean, you sort of, you mentioned in your book, and I think this is, you know, a good segue to what you're just talking about, that there was this, I mean, you use the, the phrase, a systemic slaughter of civilians um, by the Japanese. You provide some really blood curdling examples in the book. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about why that happened? Was there any, you know, strategic or tactical basis for it at all? Or was it sort of a purely ideological push on their part? Yeah, I think, well, if we if we look at the example in Manila specifically and kind of start there and kind of use that to, to, to look, you know, radiate outwards as far as examples go, you know, the 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 massacres in Manila initially started with this this idea that the local Japanese commander wanted to stop the Filipino guerrilla problem that they had, right? So again, this is this is this goes back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier in the, in the very active Filipino resistance. And so the initial orders for these executions were focused on um, Filipino guerrillas, meaning armed Filipinos that were you know conducting war against the Japanese soldiers. Well, that very quickly. Um, the definition of what a Filipino guerrilla was expanded quickly in in this battle for Manila, and pretty soon, that it was being interpreted as any man, woman, or child of Filipino origin found on the battlefield. And so, and that's where you know some of those horrific examples that I put in the book, um, which are never fun to research, never fun to write about. But you know, if you want to understand what was going on in these battles, and I think that's an important component of that. You know, they need to be shared. Um, as hard as they are to 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 deal with, um, and so you know it became a a huge problem. And then there's um, some other examples in the book where the Eleventh Airborne guys come across other massacres that were going on um, on other parts of the island. And that's why I think it's it's appropriate to use the word systemic because it came it became a wholesale slaughter across the island of the Philippines. Um, and it's also, you know, you can also go backwards in the war and look at what some of the, the Japanese soldiers were doing on mainland China. And I think you can look at, you know, Nanking and things like that to understand um, that this wasn't just isolated to the Philippines. And I think, you know, what what inspired it or what caused it, I think some of it was, you know, certainly in in, in Manila, it started off probably as a sense of frustration Right of not being welcomed as liberators by the Filipino people of 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 these folks who the Japanese were quote unquote trying to liberate, uh, you know, trying to fight back against that, if you will. So some of it was frustration, some of it was hubris, and certainly some of it has to be said was just this systemic um, superiority, for lack of a better word. I want to tread carefully on that, but but again, it's like I think the facts and the evidence speak to it, and that you know you can find no shortage of examples. Um, where that behavior was was found on the battlefield. 
Yeah, that's I didn't know that the Japanese thought they were liberating the Philippines. That's actually kind of shocking to me. Yeah, and it was that was kind of their one of the ways that they had kind of positioned their advance across the the Pacific Ocean, right? Was this idea that they were going to liberate and certainly in, you know, in some cases you can make the argument that they did that as for, you know, in some of the Dutch East, East Indies areas where there was some col- you know, colonial um, occupation going on, but then, but then they didn't hand it back. They, you know, they, the Japanese kept it right. So it's like you, you can't really make the argument that you're liberating if uh, you're not actually handing it back to somebody, right? Yeah. Well, also, just I mean, the instance of when we were talking about wartime propaganda, it, you know, it's shocking how sometimes even the higher up leadership, you know, buy their own story a little too much. That's crazy. That's right. That's right. So I know, um, you know, in the course of writing your book um, that you went through and got a lot of previously unpublished materials, um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what your book adds to the story and discussion um, that other you know, previous writers about this haven't had access to. Yeah, so I think one, there hasn't really been a lot written about the 11th Airborne Division. And just from a unique perspective, they were the only airborne division that was in the Pacific. So there was, you know, the American Army had five airborne divisions, four of them went to Europe. This, mm-hmm. The 11th was the only one that went to uh, the Pacific Theater. And I think, you know, part of what I was very fortunate from, you know, mining the archives to find personal narratives. You know, one of the things I try to do as a writer is focus on the human experience, because I think that is um, where you're going to find the compelling um, content of, of, of what happened during World War II. And so I got, I got, I was fortunate in several ways. One, finding, you know, um, diaries and letters in the archives, and then a number of families entrusted their, you know, their fathers or their grandfather's memoirs to me so I could, you know, quote and, and use those um, more robust sources to kind of help tell the story. And so I think what, you know, if I did my job right as, as, as an author, what you get a sense from reading the book is not only what it, what it was like to uh, be a paratrooper in, in the Pacific theater, which had some unique aspects to it, but again, diving down into, you know, painting with a wider brush, because a lot of those experiences were very similar of what it was like to be yeah. under attack by, you know, a bonsai, a wave of bonsai attackers, or, you know, dealing with, um, some of the situations where Japanese troops did not want to surrender and what that what that actually looked like on the battlefield. Mm. Over the course of your research, um, were there any examples that you uncovered that particularly stuck with you? Yeah, I think it was, you know, it was it was interesting because I think, you know, I had I had read a little bit about the uh, the, the Pacific theater before I started writing the book. Um, but just the brute, the, the, the sheer brutality of it was something that that shocked me and I, and I considered myself pretty well versed on the topic, so to speak. And I think it's just, you know, when you start to look into it, it's, it's extremely hard to over-exaggerate some of the things that that happened over there. And just, you know, you start to see these guys who have, you know, they've been in the rain for 30 some odd days, you know, in, in one case, you know, I'm talking about the Americans here, they've gone five, six days without food, you're not sleeping very well. And so you just start seeing the stress compounding into this, into this um, attitude, right? Of are we actually going to survive, you know, the war? And then you throw on top of that this 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 idea of your enemy is not willing to give up; they're not willing to surrender. On the rare chance that you do get one of them to surrender, nine times out of ten, it's you know it's a feint in order to get you closer to throw a hand grenade at you or things like that. And so you just really got into this this very brutal battle of of, of attrition that is just for me, became alive as I started reading these guys' stories and, and better understanding that just the depravity, if you will, of, of the situation. Yeah, one element of that that really shocked me um, was the number of troops that died from friendly fire um, you know, over the course of some of these battles. I mean, I, I guess you know, when you're talking about the confusion, I would think that that plays into that a lot, but just like a really sad fact. It was a sad fact. And yeah. And that was something that surprised me as well. And again, it's, you know, but again, it's one of those things Well, if when you stop to think about it and put yourself in that situation where, you know, you're in the middle of the jungle at night, you can't literally can't see your, your hand in front of your face. I mean, that, you know, that's an overused cliche, but I think in this case, it's extremely accurate description, right? You're under triple canopy jungle. There is no, 
you know, there is no source of light and, you know, people and, and enemy and friendlies are, are moving, you know, in the dark. And so it gets, you know, it's very easy for a 19 year old, 20 year old to become panicked in those situations. And, you know, you're, we're putting people in a situation where they're going to shoot first and ask questions later. And unfortunately there were a number of, of tragedies that occurred because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you yourself, your background is as an army paratrooper. Would you say um, that writing this book um, has added any color to your own experiences or made you look at your own experiences in the army differently? Well, I think the one thing I took away from it, and this is why in the in the subtitle of the book, I referenced brotherhood. I think one yeah. of the things that I took from um, reading more about these guys in World War II, and I, I did not personally experience any combat during my time in the, in the service. But one of the things that I took away from learning from these guys from World War II was how fortunate I was to have served with the guys that I did and um, how valuable an experience that was for me, right? And a lot of, some of that I realized at the time, the majority of it I didn't realize, unfortunately, till later in hindsight. But I think that that's, that shared experience is something that I'll always cherish. And that's something that um, I was reminded of you know, when these guys talking to these guys from World War Two. Yeah, I'm really happy you said that uh, because that prompts uh, my final question. Um, you know, you end your book very much on that note, a really nice kind of comment on the importance of camaraderie and brotherhood. Um, and I think a lot of people today think we don't have very much to learn from studying war and military history. And that to me is such a powerful counterexample because there's a national epidemic of loneliness right now. And a lot of men don't experience um, that kind of closeness and that kind of brotherhood. Um, society just has lost a lot of the avenues to kind of promote that. So I wonder if you could share a little bit um, about yeah, what the experience of the, the paratroopers in the Pacific have to say to that and what kind of lessons we can take going forward. Yeah, I think it's a great observation, Annika. Um, I think, you know, the, the the in the closing bit there in particular that you mentioned about the book was there was this very poignant letter written home by one of the troopers where he discussed the, the idea that, you know, he wasn't necessarily enjoying the war, obviously, but that if he had to go overseas and fight the war, that he couldn't think of a better group of guys uh, with which to do that, right? And he just talks, and this is a this was a letter written in in you know ni- early 1945, so it's very, you know, period based. It's very contemporary to what was going on there. And he expresses these these sentiments of just the bond that has been built up over time with these guys. And of course, a lot of that is through adversity, right? Adversity kind of breeds closeness when you're in a situation where you haven't eaten for five days and you're kind of sharing what you can find and things like that. That's going to develop that. That bond, but I think the thing, the broader thing that we can take away from it today is this notion that, you know, these guys were put in a situation um, not of their choosing, right? Their fate was very much out of their hands. Um, but I think that one of the big things that I took away from it was this notion of you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to it, which I think is an important lesson to be learned. And I think that dovetails into this idea of then how you respond to it when it's something bigger than yourself, right? And and by that, I'm referring specifically in this case to these, you know, to these guys to their left and their right, right? They weren't, you know, when you're in the jungle after a month, the, the, the realities of mom and apple pie aren't really applicable anymore. And it comes down to, um, you're there for very different reasons, right? And those reasons are, are your buddies. And I think that that's something that, you know, in, you know, bringing your question full circle, you know, when we're looking at our current, culture, it's like, well, how do I find something that's more important than me, that's bigger than me, that I can contribute to as a way to help? And I think that's something that, um, you know, I'm certainly trying to figure out how to do. It's not an easy answer, but there are there are plenty of avenues out there to do that. And I think that's where we kind of get started in paying, um, you know, homage to the legacy that these guys have kind of left us from World War II. James, Thanks so much for your time. Super interesting interview. Um, Everyone, his book is linked in the show notes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annika. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. James Fenelon on his recent book, Angels Against the Sun. The link to the book is in the show notes if you want to check it out. If you want to learn more about us and what we do at the Madison Program, you can find us at jmp.princeton.edu 
You can also find us on social media, on Twitter at Madison Program, as well as Facebook and Instagram. On our website, you can see our upcoming events here at Princeton University. You can also sign up for our mailing list and there are recordings of all the former lectures that we posted here at the Madison Program. So please do go ahead and check it out. And if you enjoyed this episode, we really do appreciate any ratings and reviews. Please do let us know how we're doing. So with no further ado, this is the end of season two, and I'll see you next time for the beginning of season three.